200 Japanese planes and a number of midget submarines took part in the attack. In that Sunday morning inferno, the Pacific fleet appeared to be completely immobilized by the sneak attack. I was awakened by uh, this radio. We were listening to the uh, Mormon Tabernacle Choir singing over the radio, and uh, all of a sudden the radio announcer broke in and he said, the islands are under attack. This is the real McCoy. After Pearl Harbor, the government organized a uh, media campaign to recruit women into the labor force. And all the media were targeted, from movies down to magazines, bubblegum wrappers. It wasn't only the men in khaki who moved forward. It wasn't only the generals. One of the nerves, vital but anonymous, was Mrs. Graham. Transportation car. Just a moment, please. The men were enlisting and being drafted. So historically, women have functioned as a reserve army of labor, and they really performed that function um, in a major way during World War II. You got me Colonel Webster in Washington, an operator. This is an urgent call. In an hour and five minutes, the battleship Arizona was completely destroyed and four others severely damaged. I was assigned to the hospital there and saw the, the really terrible things. The Hickam Field firemen coming in and, uh, and some of the little kids that were badly burned. So then uh, after uh, that kind of calmed down a bit, they asked if I would report to Washington, D.C. I saw that poster saying, we need you government girls or whatever. And I came down here on the train from Boston at that time. And um, there were just thousands of girls on that train and I was just one of them. <laughs> and still they come, like Phyllis Hood from Larchmont, New York. I think it was the first real push towards the inclusion of women from all over the country and in all backgrounds in government agencies. World War II meant a lot of different things for different kinds of women. I think that the image that most of us have when we think of, the World War, of World War II and women is Rosie the Riveter. And what she means to us is that the war opened up new kinds of opportunities for employing women. I have two sons in the Army. Now, I'm in the Army, too, in a way, because my husband's in the Navy. And I want to do a job that means more than working in a department store. My wife works, people think I can't support her. Oh, I don't mind my wife working, but who's going to run my home? It's okay now, but what about after the war? The women will have all the jobs. Before the end of the year, 2,400,000 more must be enrolled in war work, which means not only in the Army, the Navy, the Marines, but in the factories, on the farms, in various essential civilian occupations now filled by men who are being called to the colors. Every woman who can possibly help is wanted. Their country is calling them. It was sort of conveyed that this was women's patriotic duty to make themselves beautiful and glamorous for the soldiers. And the soldiers on the other side were, of course, collecting pinups. And pinups were a major part of, of the war. And uh, there was a soldier quoted in the Saturday Evening Post who said, we're not only fighting for the four freedoms, we're fighting for the precious privilege of making love to American women. Socially, I was financially independent. I didn't have to report to anybody. And this didn't mean that I ran around being wild. My values had been established. What you do have, I think, is a situation in which the opportunity for attraction of a sexual or physical nature is simply more present. It's more present uh, across racial lines. It's more present across class lines. It's more present within sexual lines and gender lines. Wherever they come from, they are the same kind of girls that you know in your hometown. They walk four abreast in the streets. They chatter like magpies in the streetcars and buses. Most of them smoke cigarettes. Lots of them like a cocktail. They like their jobs. They were free to do whatever they wanted, and they didn't have their parents hanging over them. In the late 19th century, it was still the case that middle-class American women were assumed either not to have sexual desire or 
to have such latent sexual desire that only the really hard work of men could awaken it. <laughs> personnel branch promotes dances. Sometimes as many as 1,500 attend. Dance trips to the various service clubs are sponsored. About once a week, about 150 girls are taken to Fort Meade, the largest training center to dance with the boys. Blocks of engagements and a few marriages have resulted from these excursions. If I went out to lunch and I was not going to have a, a dinner date that night, I would go to Shoals Cafeteria or the National Press Cafeteria, and for 50 cents, you'd get a really big meal, and, that would, and then I would have a light thing at supper, but otherwise, I would save it for my dinner day. I got here in 43, and I'm not quite sure when I joined it, but both my friend and I joined the stage door canteen. You had to be fingerprinted by the FBI. You were not allowed, the rules were you were not allowed to date anyone outside. Now that was where occasionally people did that. Washington um, just was swarming with uh, servicemen uh, on weekends especially. I mean you always saw they were always in sight wherever you went. I had a few invitations. I was pretty innocent and landed up in the wrong place and vanished as quickly as I could. So you know, a lot of young men were going overseas and they didn't know whether they were coming back. 